good evening to you all. Um, I will be brief because I think I've done a few of these evenings before, which I love. I was saying to my my colleagues and friends here, I wish my whole working life was like this, where you have a beer and just relax and, and still talk about work-related things. But I think the questions are are really more important than what I. Eric, of course, has wonderful things to say. We know each other, by the way. Um, we've worked indirectly with each other for a long period of time, so we're not strangers. Um, what I have to say. I'll be relatively to the point. Um, I am a bioethicist, and I don't want to get into a lot of details about that, but I'm clinical. Uh, I work in Mount Sinai Hospital here in Toronto. I'm also at the University of Toronto. Um, I see patients directly. I do a broad range of things, but part of what I do is, is really often the interface of life and death. Uh, we have two intensive care units. One's neonatal for babies, one is for adults. Previous to that, I was a medical social worker um, for over 10 years where I worked exclusively in critical care. And so, over my working life, and this isn't a brag, but I, I, I've really seen, unfortunately, hundreds and hundreds of people die. Um, and I know we're talking about physician-assisted suicide, which is something different than what goes on in our hospitals. But for a long time, a lot of years in my working life, I believed there was a world of difference between what I was taught the difference was between killing and letting die. So letting die is a person's on life support, they're not recovering, they're not going to recover, or they don't appear to be going to recover. We don't think they would want this, and so we slow down or stop the life support and let them go. I used to believe there was a world of difference between that and the kind of things we're discussing tonight, which is doing something more active to end the life of the person. I'm not convinced they're as radically different as for many of years of my life I thought they were. Uh, I'm not saying they're interchangeable because they're not interchangeable. I do think there still is a difference. But I've, I've really come a long way on this because I was very, very much against any form of assisted dying uh, for most of my, And I'm still extremely nervous of it and have great reservations. But I do think we've reached the point where we need to have the conversation. And I think as a nation, we have to move forward with some form of legislation. It may be quite narrow, and it may be quite limited. I want to be very clear why I see this as a problem. People say to me, well, you're an ethicist. And you should be categorically saying that people have a right to choose. And it's not that complicated of a capable person has a right to say, I'm done, I've had enough. I believe it to a point. What worries me about it is that when people talk about people with disability, attitudes towards the elderly, I take this very seriously. And I take this very seriously from what I've seen in my working life and even in my personal life, that I think most of us who are able-bodied have, including me, by the way, uh, have absolutely no idea what the world is like and life is like for people with living, living with disability. And we tend to project a lot of very negative images towards that that we don't fully understand. And when people say, you know, I worry that attitudes towards disability will really shift if the state, which is pretty well what a lot of people are asking, take a position that some types of lives are not worth living. I, I do worry that it will have an effect on how we see uh, people living with disability. If, if you take a situation like someone with quadriplegia, meaning, you know, to the medical, non-medical people, the full paralysis, you know, upper and lower body, if, if that person were to attempt suicide, um, and, and you compare that to an able-bodied person that attempted suicide, I would say our reactions would be very different, in which we would look at someone with quadriplegia and say, well, that's understandable. What kind of a life could that be? You know, yet we have no idea what kind of a life that could be. And I think we're projecting, and an able-bodied person, we bend over backwards to try and intervene and help the person. And the other one, well, that makes a lot of sense. But I think our minds are already so set and so negative that I worry about that a great deal. 
And I, I think, you know, in a youth-oriented world that we live in now, that our attitudes towards the elderly are not positive. And I think we may look to the elderly person in a wheelchair with whatever limitations he or she may have trying to carry on and get through the day. I worry in some, you know, we, we could look to that and think, now why would they do that to other people? Why wouldn't they ask for assisted death? So if you're wondering where is this guy at on this, he's all over the place, um, it's partly true um, because those are the inner conflicts that have evolved. But I want to be clear, I do think we need to move forward and I do, need, I do think we need to do it in an extremely cautious way. And what worries me with moving forward is when people say that, you know, choice is really clear. You just have a capable person making a choice. I worry about that because when the society is reflecting so many negative images back related to disability and aging, that is it truly, you know, if you look at the person and let's imagine she's, she's living with family, she may have a, a serious and even terminal illness, she's been hospitalized before, and she's thinking, well, you know, I can't get a lot of support at home, I don't want to be hospitalized again, and I don't want my family members having to take time off work to take care of me as I die. I think I'll ask for euthanasia. Is that truly a free and autonomous wish? or is the society not moving along in that way? So I do think we move forward, but I take, I take you know, great caution in worrying about the rights and the well-being of people with, with disability in this way, because I think that is one of the most important things. But I'm not convinced anymore, as I once was, that there's a world of difference, there can be, between you know, the kinds of end-of-life decisions that we make virtually every day in this country in our hospitals and what some people are asking for. I also think we can look to Luxembourg and we can look to Switzerland and we can look to Oregon and all of these places and it helps us to some extent but we have to find a way to move forward within a Canadian context and reflective of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom. I think that is one of the most important things is we have to find our own way to do it. But in a mature democratic society, for a long time I also thought, when I, when I would hear the polls, that the majority of Canadians want some form of, I always thought, I wonder if they really understand the question. I, I, I know that sounds very patronizing, but there's so many different terms flying around as to what, what we actually mean by this. But as I've looked to more and more feedback and, and the structure for more of the questions, I actually do believe the majority of Canadians do understand what exactly the question is. And, and also, you know, this is a democracy. Final point. Notice final already. I'm keeping it short. Um, I think one of the real limitations has been healthcare workers, of which I'm one, have been incredibly silent on this. And we've been hiding behind the rope to Supreme Court judges, saying this is not a decision for us. This is a decision for the Supreme Court of Canada or, or whatever it may be. Yet the Supreme Court of Canada is likely going to look to the many healthcare workers in this country and say, what do you think? You know what goes on on a daily basis. Um, and I think, and I'm not saying all healthcare workers in this country have to have a position. I do not believe that. But I think we have got to have voices coming from within the healthcare community as well on this. I think it's incredibly important. Thank you. And I'm going to pass this over to my colleague, Dr. Gary Roden. Thanks.